most of the people sitting, some still there trying to get some food or Weiser Spritzer, chant when with some beer, hope you enjoy it. So the only room of guilds that you will find outside of Austria is actually here in Berkeley, it's the only license the room of brewery gives out and we're still trying to figure out why this is, probably some personal relations to know each other, right? Okay, here you have a license also here in Berkeley. So yeah, please uh, feel free to take some more of this uh, uh, Truma Pills later on. <laughs> Very welcome, warm welcome ladies and gentlemen to our first Open Austria uh, Open Chat. Martin will tell you a little bit more about this new format. Um, it's been a super exciting six months now. I can't believe we're already here for six months now uh, with Open Austria. We've been incredibly busy um, working with people from Austria coming here, working with you, our community, and we're incredibly grateful to have such a good feedback and co uh, commitment and input uh, from you, from you guys here. So in a short time, we really have gathered a, a beautiful crowd. I'm happy to see so many familiar faces, but uh, even more happy then, or as much happy, uh, to see also some new faces here. So we hope that our community will keep growing, be it uh, Austrians, be it Americans, or any from any other parts of the world, we will see each other. Okay, a little closer, is that better? Yeah. <laughs> right, so it's been exciting times, uh, and uh, be it at the Christmas party, at the last uh, security mixer, I see some, some people there who still remember the party or the day after, but we're not just here to serve your punch and uh, beer. Our mission actually is to connect Austria and Silicon Valley in business, science, technology, and the arts. So we're developing uh, new formats as the Open Chat today, but we're also uh, bringing forward new uh, older or like established initiatives like the Go Silicon Valley initiatives. And uh, yeah, on behalf of the Open Austria team, very warm welcome. I want to point out uh, one of our colleagues who is just coming up right now, Anna, who did a great job uh, setting up the event, and also Susanne, who unfortunately can't be here right now, she's in Austria right now, so a big chunk of the of the organization here also goes to her, so please a big hand to our colleagues who work in the background of this event. Just one more word, I'm really happy that uh, we can do this event here, and Martin will talk more about this in detail, and also see an old colleague from the Wien here, Peter, great to have you, but obviously uh, very happy to see Sarah and uh, Charlie here, looking uh, very much forward to hear your statements and I hand over to Martin, who I'm very grateful for working with. Thank you for a great collaboration the next, last six months. Thank you so much, George. Uh, I'm Martin, also from Open Austria. Very happy to be here. I uh, just want to say very, very briefly what we want to do uh, with this series, which we are kicking off tonight, Open Chat. Uh, Open Chat is also the hashtag, uh, in case you want to tweet. tweet. Um, so Open Chat is a, a fireside uh, chat um, event series, which we are going to, um, there is a backlash here. Siri is answering. <laughs> yeah, so we have some things here and I. Um, and uh, so it's a fireside chat series which we're going to kick off tonight. Uh, we're going to have in April, uh, we're already planning one on the innovation in aerospace industry and in May one on the war on talent. Uh, so exciting things coming up, uh, but tonight uh, we want to kick this off with a topic uh, that we think is ideal and a partner that we think is ideal uh, to showcase what we really want to do. Uh, social entrepreneurship uh, is a topic that really is important for us at Open Austria, reflects our values. We do not only believe in innovation between Austria and the rest of the world, but we also believe uh, in values that are there and action and using innovation in order to shape and change the world. Uh, and we are really happy that we have uh, with Impact Hub uh, a fantastic partner. Um, I want to really thank you also for your uh, help in uh, organizing this event, supporting us uh, in having uh, and providing us with this fantastic space. Uh, Impact Hub has its uh, headquarters of the global network in Vienna, so there's the connection there. Um, and uh, we have, of course, fantastic speakers uh, today, uh, Charlie and, and Peter. So this is for us the ideal event. I want to uh, now hand over uh, to uh, Sarah. Um, Sarah is uh, also from Austria, uh, but uh, since four years uh, here in, in the Bay Area, before in Vienna, uh, she was one of the founding me members of Impact Hub Vienna. Uh, and now 
Uh, she is uh, in charge of uh, the issue, she's part of the global uh, impact network with I think 15,000 um, members uh, and there she is also responsible for impact assessment uh, which is an annual uh, assessment uh, where she works with all of those members and there she works in close collaboration with one of our speakers with uh, Peter of the Vienna uh, University of Business and Economics, a uh, very close partner of us as well. So we're really happy that this event is, is coming together so nicely, really happy that you're, you came all here. Uh, please uh, don't forget uh, to sign up uh, for our newsletters at openaustria.com. Um, also share our, our Twitter feed uh, and thank you so much for coming tonight and I'll hand it all over to the safe hands of Sarah. Thank you. Thank you very much. Okay. Um, hello, welcome, <laughs> and hello to um, social to the first social entrepreneurship fireside um, chat on how technology and innovation can power change. Or um, as Peter promoted it, um, we're in the Bay Area. Let's listen to three Austrians talking English. Um, <laughs> but we're not alone here, um, so that's good. Um, and to actually, I would like to maybe at the beginning get a little bit of a um, feeling like who's in um, the audience, because I know that um, the events from Open Austria draw a very a different, very diverse crowd. Um, and I think we can participate in that as well. So basically I would like to know who in the audience um, is an entrepreneur or runs a startup? Great, okay, and a lot. Um, who is an accelerator or somebody that supports entrepreneurs? Mm -hmm. um, who works for a consulate? Or in yeah. okay. <laughs> okay. 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 Um, and then maybe also who works for a larger corporation or a large business? Good. And lastly, who works for nonprofits? Okay, so it's very diverse actually, the audience that we have. Um, and uh, maybe the other thing I would like to know is uh, who sees the Bay Area as a permanent home? Okay, who sees it as a temporary home? Who's undecided? Good, thank you. Um, so also we are actually um, quite on the spectrum of um, uh, living here. I'm here since four years, Peter three months, Charlie 30 years. So um, also here, a big diversity. Um, so before we start, or actually to get us um, started right now, I mean, maybe like a last question. Who of you has heard about social entrepreneurship before and knows about social entrepreneurship? Okay, so quite a lot of people actually. Good, good. Um, on the panel um, with, um, with me today, um, we have Charlie Kleisner. Uh, Charlie is an impact investor um, who believes that the meaning of wealth is to make a positive contribution to humanity and the planet. Um, and to see the impact and see the impact investment as an expression of who he really is and not just a theoretical concept. Um, he's the co-founder of the KL Solicitors Foundation, Social Impact International, um, and with those organizations supports entrepreneurs and accelerates um, and scales them. Um, he also co-founded Tonic, who has an office here um, at the Impact Hub as well. Um, and the 100% Impact Network, so both networks, um, global networks for um, active impact investors. And is living in the Bay Area since 30 years, um, since the mid 80s, worked first at Next and then Arriva and then became an impact investor. And then um, we have Peter Vandor, um, senior researcher for, of the Vienna University of Economics and Business, um, so the VUB, um, co-founder of the Social Entrepreneurship Center um, at the VUB, which is at the Competence Center for Nonprofit and Social Entrepreneurship, and also co-founder of the Social Impact Award, which is a startup competition for early stage ideas um, that tackle social or environmental problems. Um, he's been leading over 50 collaboration projects with organizations such as the United Nations and the ESSA Foundation and SAM, um, was nominated as a global shaper, and is also a <coughs> Scancor, yes. visiting <laughs> scholar at Stanford University right now. So just very excited to have you on the panel with me. And we're gonna take about, I think, up to 30 minutes to like talk, we have a couple of um, questions prepared and then also want to like um, get your questions in. Um, 
I would, like, I know that quite a few actually um, did say that social entrepreneurship is not something completely new for them, but I know for some people it might be, and also I know that defining social entrepreneurship sometimes can be tricky. So to maybe kick us off, <laughs> uh, Peter, like from your academic perspective, can you maybe show like a briefly let us know how you would describe social entrepreneurship? Yep, sure. Uh, good evening, everyone. Hi. And thanks for everyone uh, for making this happen. So uh, both Austria, Apex Hub, um, and everyone who helped bring in the catering and so on. Um, so defining social entrepreneurship is, is a thing that, that has, um, I think there are, there are as many definitions as researchers are in the field, so it, it has taken quite a while in, in the academic field to get up uh, some kind of coherent definition. Um, I would like to offer a simple one that is sort of captures probably 80% of what most features talk about, um, which is. Oh, is it on? Check. Better? Yeah. All right, super. It's also it. I just need to talk louder. <laughs> So um, it's basically a very simple concept in the sense that um, about 30, uh, 30 years ago, um, actually I think it was Bill Braden who started the whole discussion. He realized that the concept of entrepreneurship, so looking at people who uh, bring in novel ideas, novel products, novel services, um, and do this, do this against odds by taking risks, that this concept also exists uh, in a social sphere. So he coined the term first public entrepreneur and then quickly stitched to social entrepreneurs. So, Social entrepreneurship looks at the agents of those who create social value and try to figure out what is the process and who are the owners of the process to bring in new, improved uh, solutions basically into the system. Um, it's probably a bit technical, uh, an example would be, um, there are many of them, but, but one example that I particularly like is Atempo. It's a fairly unknown uh, social enterprise in, in Austria. Does anyone know it? Yes. <laughs> <laughs> I talked to him yesterday in the morning. Nice. <laughs> Oh, I'd like to hear more about what about. Okay, but yeah. maybe that's for after. So at a Tempo, what they do, actually they do a lot of different things, but one of the projects I like most um, is called Capito. They work with, uh, work with people with intellectual, um, intellectual disabilities, thanks. And they go about it um, that they, in a way that they employ these people. And usually it's not very easy to find uh, employment for someone who has an intellectual disability. Um, but they found a pro uh, project or a product where this makes a lot of sense. So what they're selling is that they're selling um, basically a, a certification process for online and offline content, text content. So they make sure that the, um, they certify whether a content is easily readable. I think the level is, um, maybe you're aware of this, this um, language testing uh, scheme where you go up from A1 to, to C2, C2 being the highest level of, of competence in language they make sure that basically none of the text is above A2. And they make it uh, by, by um, working with people with intellectual disabilities who read the text and who point out which, what, what parts are not understandable. And then they are included in, in rewriting the text in a better way. Um, so this creates uh, unemployment opportunities, income, um, and at the same time offers a service that, that is uh, needed on the market. So that, that would be an example for a social innovation. They also uh, spread through social franchise. So I think they do check a lot of boxes. Nice. So you, the example you brought is actually like um, providing opportunities for people that might not have access to an employment market um, and at the same time uh, having a business innovation come with that as well. Um, how would you, how would, you, would you add something to that? Well, I first uh, also thank you for inviting me. You know, when we moved here in 86, we thought that we would stay here for three to five years. <laughs> and 31 years later, you know, we're still still here. And uh, I'm also really uh, grateful for uh, being here at the Impact Hub, which I've been associated with for, I think, seven or eight years, chairing the uh, Global Advisory Board and uh, supporting the team in Europe and, uh, and also here. And then, of course, social entrepreneurship and uh, Silicon Valley is an interesting uh, juxtaposition that I look forward to exploring a little bit uh, tonight. And uh, 
And so in order to put a little bit more color and uh, more generational uh, twist in that, I want to introduce uh, my daughter, Andy Kleisner. She's sitting right here. And she's actually uh, a Stanford graduate and a social entrepreneur. So she is the one that combines these two things. And maybe you introduce yourself quickly so people know you. Because I'm going to ask you a couple of questions too. Real life example. Yes, so I, my name is Andy. And I freue mich, dass ich da bin. And thank you, everyone, for coming together tonight. And yeah, my brother is also here. Alex. <laughs> <laughs> family affair. It is a family affair. And happy to dive in and uh, answer any questions as a social entrepreneur. I'm sitting next to another social entrepreneur. And I think there's a lot in the house. So I look forward to the conversation all together. Great. Wonderful. And so, so to me, social entrepreneurs are entrepreneurs who are driven by their desire to make a positive impact on the environment and the social challenges of our times. And they want to be uh, financially sustainable because otherwise they will not be able to go to scale. Okay. Um, can you give us, I mean, because we, you gave us a kind of an example of the um, social enterprise in, in Austria. Do you have uh, from your work with uh, Tonic or just your experience from the market? Maybe other um, examples, maybe from the U.S. that you could share with us. Absolutely, and so so let's let's key off uh, with a couple of uh, more socially oriented entrepreneurs, and then entrepreneurs who made it big and have a component, arguably, about that. Yeah. And because uh, let's start out with the la last one first, because it's a big debate in the impact investing community. Let's say uh, Tesla. Okay. So Tesla, uh, so people say is Tesla an impact investment or not, right? And so impact investors, in order to really judge that, you need to understand the motivation and the intentionality of the investor behind that. So if an investor says, I believe that Elon can change the industry of cars and transportation to uh, include or maybe even be driven by electric cars, and that's the impact that you seek, and you make that investment because of this, and you then measure it on that impact, then it's an impact investment. Mm -hmm. If you invested in Elon's Tesla company in order to make a quick buck, and you wouldn't care about you know, the change in the industry, then it's not an impact investment, right? Yeah. It gets a little bit more complicated if you look at Uber, you know, because um, you know, as impact investors really uh, care about the regenerative capacity of the investments that we have. And regenerative is not only on the environmental side, but also on the relationship side between the investor and the investee and all stakeholders, right? And uh, I would argue that uh, that's not in the right relationship in that particular example. And most impact investors would say, no, this is not an impact investment because they, they, they are disadvantaged, uh, they disadvantage their drivers and they are not, you know, they have many, many issues that are really not in the right relationship. Mm -hmm. Now going back, however, to um, accelerators, since I saw there's a few accelerators in here, right? Uh, Lisa and I have been involved in uh, three accelerators quite um, from the start. The first one in India, and uh, that has been active uh, since 2003, and, uh, and generated great entrepreneurs that we invested in, or, and many others invested in, like uh, BioLite with uh, Jonathan Cedar, Embrace, Husk Power Systems, D-Light, they all came to that uh, accelerator, right? And if we measure the, um, the impact of an accelerator with the amount, with, with the access to Benic Capital, appropriate Benic Capital, right? And we measure that with us, right? About 50% should get that after about 12 months, and that has been a very successful accelerator with many, many entrepreneurs coming out of that. Lisa is doing an accelerator in Hawaii where we work with Hawaiian entrepreneurs and uh, particularly focused on the challenges and opportunities of uh, island economies, right? And uh, from a sustainability standpoint, with the spirit of aloha and the spirituality integrated into that. And then I've been involved as, as a co-founder in the Viennese investment yeah. program, right? right? And out of these come dozens of entrepreneurs and some of them we invest in that, that really are coming more from, from the social side or environmental side that then uh, you know, go up into financial sustainability. Great, thank you. And also maybe to, just to clarify, because you referred to Lisa quite a bit, so Lisa yeah. Kleitner is your, your wife? That's so. correct, yeah, of, uh, of 30, for five years. Congratulations. Bringing... Um, bringing it kind of back to like where we are um, now as well, uh, basically in the Bay Area or in Silicon Valley, um, 
the Silicon Valley being described as kind of the center for entrepreneurship, the center for innovation. Um, my question would be, did, um, has Silicon Valley, in your opinion, embraced social entrepreneurship? The short answer is no, not yet. Okay. 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 <laughs> And uh, so think about the, uh, so Silicon Valley is synonymous and rightly so with venture capital, right? And venture capital was invented uh, here uh, in the 60s and 70s and then scaled up when the pension funds and institutional capital could actually invest in a venture, right? Mm -hmm. And, uh, and but the, the way that venture capital works is you have to have these unicorns that, uh, that, that where you get 100x back in, in your evaluation of the company. And social enterprises usually don't do that, right? There's almost no social enterprise that I know of that would create the valuation that fits the venture capital model. And therefore, you cannot apply the same type of term sheets and the same type of GP, uh, general partner, limited partner structures to social entrepreneurism. It doesn't work. And so the challenge is, would the VC community be able to adapt uh, uh, partially you know, to, to at least co-invest in some of these investments bringing their innovation capacity and their know-how to the table, but then collaborate and co-invest with impact investors and maybe even not-for-profits to have a bigger impact together than only they could have or, or, or your brand giving could, could have. And so we can talk a lot more about um, you know, the innovation capacity of Silicon Valley and how that translates into, into enabling social, social entrepreneurs to be successful, which I believe is also true, right? Uh, but in my opinion, if Silicon Valley in the next 30 years is not at least partially addressing the big uh, issues of the planet, meaning uh, climate change and social justice and, so, and inequality and uh, resource constraints around water and everything else, that it will not be as relevant uh, as it is today. Okay. Um kind of building on that and also on the title around of technology and um, how technology and innovation can power change. Did you like from your and also from your experience now here in um, Silicon Valley slash Bay Area, do you, um, yeah, have you come across any exciting examples in the time that you've been here? Yeah, um, first of all to, to the question uh, that you asked before, um, I was, one of the biggest surprises coming here for the last three months was that I expected something different in terms of how entrepreneurship and social entrepreneurship are related in, in the Bay Area to each other because the, the narrative of, of entrepreneurship and, and in particular in Silicon Valley is changing the world. Mm -hmm. So I was expecting that in a place when entrepreneurship is so big and you kind of assume that there is the same diversity as in every place, some, some people want to change the world, some people want to be engineers and usually they end up kind of working together. Assuming this, I was assuming that these two discourses would be connected. So that you have meetups for entrepreneurs, you have meetups for social entrepreneurs, and people move between spaces. Um, and I'm very curious, maybe uh, also from the audience later on, whether this is a whether anyone feels that this is this way. Does anyone feel that entrepreneurship events and social entrepreneurship events say have uh, the same audiences? No, no, no. really, yeah. Yeah. no. Oakland, yeah. Oakland, yeah. 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 With the impact hub there, right? So that's uh, the Oakland Impact Hub is a little bit more integrated. Yeah. And I think we want to do an impact hub in Palo Alto, but it never materialized. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> sure, sure. So that's that, that, that's quite surprising because where, where if not here uh, should this happen? Um, but but just you know, having arrived as a temporary guest, I feel that uh, uh, there are many different disconnected worlds here in the Bay Area. So. Um, in, in that sense, yes, I came across a couple of interesting ones, but um, probably some of the more interesting ones I haven't come across because they are not in Palo Alto. You know, the other thing that, that is going on in Silicon Valley with social entrepreneurs is actually um, programs at the universities. So Stanford has, uni has programs around you know, social entrepreneurs, and Andy has led a couple of those. Santa Clara University is very, very active with the, with the GSPI and program and, and, and that, and we're very supportive of that. But you see, the mentors from Silicon Valley just come in as mentors. They're not really engaged uh, beyond that. Yeah. And do you have like ideas on, on how to, I mean, is this something you're working on? I guess I imagine you are. Well, you know, I, so, so my, my prime time in Silicon Valley was between 86 and 2002. <laughs> And, uh, and so I tried to activate my cohort between 2002 and 2005, unsuccessfully. And now I think Mark, you know, Zuckerberg and 
and the media are, you know, are doing uh, great things uh, in challenging the status quo. And um, you know, I personally miss Steve Jobs, whom I worked with uh, for about four years, because I think at this stage in his life he would challenge the, you know, the, the philanthropy side big time. And uh, because, uh, I mean, now that I declared that I worked for Steve, you, you, you probably understand my comments about uh, Gates and Gates Foundation better. Uh, but uh, you know, Gates is managing his philanthropy according to what he did with business, and that's uh, you know, centralized from Seattle, trying to do it all over the world, and 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 and, and controlling, right? As opposed okay. to really delegating and working with uh, you know in a distributed way, and then challenging the way that uh, that the system works. Uh, you know, we don't have that many people doing that. And the Mark Zuckerbergs, they would be the next generation, and hopefully they would step up to that. I'm hopeful. Okay. Um, and. Building on, on what you also said around um, the kind of like fragmentation that you um, that you experienced, is this something that you want to like build on more, or where you would see um, maybe other ways or like ways to overcome that? I know that's a big question. <laughs> how, how to overcome uh, divided country spaces? I, I don't know. Like that's that's probably the big question. Uh, but, um, <laughs> Just ask <laughs> Peter. I, I think I think what the Impact Hub is doing already is, is kind of part of the answer. I mean, you try to have a branched, branched organization where people are in, I mean, you can't force people to relocate, so you just have to uh, make the, the spaces where they can meet and have, um, and have, those have some sort of interactions. Yeah. That said, I, I'm wondering how much interaction there is between the different Impact Hubs. Mm -hmm. I, I think um, it's a personal issue. So people who understand that they're impact with their lives is depending on their inner state of uh, peace and, uh, and, and grounding, right? They will actually understand that. And if you, if, you, if you live a career where you never take the time to reflect on the meaning of your life on a deeper level, then you confuse your career and your status with wealth with what you, who, who you really are. And particularly men in Silicon Valley when they're in their 40s and 50s, you know, they are not willing to step off the treadmill uh, because it's, you know, everybody caters to your ego, you're so great, you're so good, and, and you know, and do one more and one more startup and all that, you know, as opposed to reflecting on that. And so, so what I would like to challenge Silicon Valley on is to explore the awareness and consciousness, uh, you know, building and how technology and AI could be activated for that, as opposed to optimizing, you know, the uh, rental capacity of uh, private jets for the top 1% of the population. <coughs> All right. <laughs> I believe you're right, and I believe that to some extent it's happening, at least from the from the fragmented information pieces that you get. Um, for example, Y Combinator is starting an experiment yeah. on uh, universal income, and and many of the tech entrepreneurs. I mean, American philanthropy is changing at a high pace from inherited capital to, to newly self-made capital, and that is happening because, amongst others, the Bay Area entrepreneurs, when when they reach their 40, 50 years, maybe a bit later, they start to set up these funds. Mark Zuckerberg even earlier. So that is, um, that may be a reaction, that may be kind of on a systematic level, the reaction of the tech world uh, changing their perception, and realizing that they might lose their relevance. Well, I, th I think, you know, technology and awareness and consciousness are the driving factors of change. And, and I think the, there is a nexus to enable that. And I think the smartphone revolution, the uh, the the, the uh, intelligent algorithm revolution. If they can, if they can just be targeted to making a positive impact, they will. I mean, we can deliver now services, healthcare services, education services, to hundreds of millions of Indians and Africans who were not enabled before to receive these services, right? And that's clearly coming out of, you know, partially Silicon Valley. The modern platforms, without modern plat with modern platforms. Where investors in purpose.com change.org is a phenomenal platform for organizing, you know, for human, for humanity, not for only one tribe anymore, right? And, and to cross these boundaries, we can now collaborate across the globe in, in an unprecedented way to address issues, right, based on Silicon Valley technology. And so I think that is, if we could do more of that, that would have a major impact. So you see the technology a lot as an enabler basically enabler, as well yeah. and can be an enabler for social entrep um, entrepreneurship also. 
Hmm. Also think about you know the data analysis. Uh, if if we were to uh, target the big data analysis on on uh, on the big problems again, right? Yeah. As opposed to trying to optimize the lives of the privileged only, right? Then that would be a really great use. And then couple that with lean data analysis of reaching out to the people that we try to serve and get their feedback directly with the new technology as opposed to do all these intermediaries who could get their cuts and then interpret data differently. Those are great opportunities. Um, talking about that, um, basically as well, like using technology, using data, using different platforms um, to enable social entrepreneurship, I think um, the question also comes up uh, around capital and um, the need for capital in order to um, drive that change as well and the role that um, capital plays in that, um, which kind of brings us to, to impact investment. Um, so uh, the same way, <laughs> Kind of as we distinguish between entrepreneurship and social entrepreneurship, do we distinguish between investment and impact investment? And you mentioned um, a little bit about that already. Um, but can you talk a little bit more about, because um, you've been like, you're basically a pioneer in the field and creator of the field as well, of um, how you define impact investment and what kind of investment vehicles you work with? Yeah, sure. Um, so impact investing is pretty much defined by four, um, four categories, four attributes. One is it's an investment approach. Means that your whole portfolio needs to be invested in impact. It's not just an asset class like public equities or cash. So all your wealth can be aligned with impact. That's the investment approach. Number two is it's intentional. So, um, and the, uh, for those of you who have thought a little bit more about intentionality, you know, intentionality that's not ego-based and that's detachment from the outcome is actually a very powerful force of alignment. And if you use that force of alignment between the investor and the investee to really, uh, you know, establish the right level of expectations on a level that's not ego-based or maximizing financial return only based, then that is a big uh, force behind, uh, be, be behind success. Can you give an example of that or can you just like explain how that would play out? In yes. So, you know, impact investors are really uh, um, trying to change the system, right, ultimately, because um, it's not only about one, for, for instance, our approach is to change the financial system. So we, we, we want to change the financial system to include these externalities that, that the macroeconomists uh, conveniently define as external to the system mm -hmm. to integrate them into the system. So right now, you know, the modern portfolio theory doesn't serve us any, any, anymore. And I wish that the 95% of students who are still learning the old, old methodologies that really are wrong, plainly wrong, because they, they, they created climate change, you know, all these big externalities, they are not internalized into the system. And so, uh, so that's our approach. We can talk about that more. It's, you know, it's a deep approach of movement building and, 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 and trying to build uh, prototypes and sample portfolios around that. And so that's the intentionality behind it. And uh, if your intention is, is um, let's say, to really, to really help uh, a segment of the population that's disadvantaged with the service that helps them, you know, to, to, to alleviate them out of whatever, you know, some, some of their poverty or whatever, then, then you bring that intention to your investment and you make sure that you're aligned with your investee or any intermediary that you have in between. And very important, you know, we don't, I don't think we have any fund managers here, but fund managers need to be aligned with that as well. You're talking about products, right? So Better Ventures, for instance, is an investment that we have done here, you know, that's, uh, that, that has the premise of using technology, but for social entrepreneurs. And they have done 11 investments now and, and really great, great investments that combine these two things. But the, the, third, the third component of uh, impact investing besides intentionality and approach is that, they, that we care about both financial return and impact. And the fourth one is that we measure the impact. Good, nice. <laughs> yeah. Great. Um, and do you, um, no, 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 I'm just, um, that just like kind of like sparked, uh, sparked something for me. Um, well, you, you know what to do about your cash? You have cash, right? A little bit. <laughs> yeah. So what do you do with your cash? I'm the wrong person okay. to ask, but is it's it sitting in the bank right now. Which, which bank? 
Different bank. Yeah. So, so here we go. You know, I would I would encourage all of you to ask your bank what what, what the bank does with your money, right? Exactly. We're about to yeah. switch because it Good. fits at Wells Fargo, but we're going to switch to a uh, credit union. Yeah. Here we go. Yeah. So since everybody has cash, right, and, and you want to know, usually, well, you you want to know that it doesn't do something that you don't believe in, normally, right? Yeah. Yeah. And so you want to at least detoxify your portfolio so it doesn't work against your values, right? And so we banked with Bank of America, and when we did the research, where well, they, they finance the old coal industry, which is incompatible with our values, right? Yeah. And so how can I give my cash to a bank that finances something that I don't believe in? It doesn't work for me. And so fortunately, in, in the US, we have all these beautiful banks, you know, community development banks, including New Resource Bank here, yeah. you know, that, that actually are very transparent with what they do with your bank, right? Yeah. Do you have a pension plan? Um. A 401k, maybe? Uh, yeah. Ah, what do you do with that? Um, actually, me personally, I do not have one, so okay. I cannot help you with that, <laughs> unfortunately not. So it's very important to ask your 401k provider, you know, to align, it's, it's your future for God's sake, you, you know, if you're many young people in here that don't draw down on that for 30 years, if in those 30 years your 401k dollars work against your future, that does not make sense, right? No. And so you've got to demand from your 401k providers an impact platform. You know, like we do with impact assets yeah. and the donor advice funds. You know. And your social enterprise should provide you with a 401k. Yes. Yeah. So, so my point is that it's not only for, impact investing is not only for the affluent anymore, but we all have responsibility of asking what our money does. That's, 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 that's a very good point. And um, in, in my personal case, it's uh, my husband that um, is pushing for getting us out of Wells Fargo and into the credit union. Okay. And I think Once after this conversation, I will have to yeah. do it. <laughs> Um, so basically, like, but basically, you're saying like calling on everybody on thinking around like where do you put your money? And if you invest in public equities, a lot of us do. You know, that's that's the most difficult asset class for impact, because if you just invest, if you just trade, you know, in a publicly held company, it doesn't add to the impact of that publicly traded company unless you vote your proxies, or it's you know, or unless you demand. Uh, that 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 they that they provide more visibility and more reporting on on the environmental, social, and governance criteria. And so, if you do invest in funds, make sure that they are at least ESG, environmental, social, and governance, you know, aligned. But that's not enough because that draws in British Petroleum, for instance, which we, we could never invest in, right? So, yeah. you have to be careful about you know if you don't want to invest in fossil fuel stuff, then you know you have to be careful. Yes, um, bringing us um, maybe from from that. Um, before we like open it up to the audience, because um, we talked a little bit like, okay, we talk about the Bay Area, we talk about um, impact investment here, um, what kind of vehicles are um, are available here as well, but how does that look like in, in Austria and in Central and Eastern Europe? Um, and how does it differ? And like, all, as well, what does the pipeline actually look like? Well, I would, I would say in Austria, um, it's quite different. Um, and first of all, because of the, the simple sheer magnitude, both in entrepreneurship and social entrepreneurship. Um, you, uh, I've recently heard a number um, from, from Mario, I don't, I don't know the source beyond that, but um, that there is about 50, 60,000 startups currently in the Bay Area. The ones that constantly reproducing themselves, becoming either uh, incumbents or, or dying off and starting anew. Um, I think the similar number in Vienna is significantly smaller, probably. 500, 1,000, 2,000, depending on, on where you come. So by, by simply magnitude of order, it's, it's, it's clear that there is less going on. Um, also in terms of impact investing, I think um, the, the one impact investing program that I know is actually the one that we started. So <laughs> other than that, there is little institutionalized work on the, on the ecosystem. Interestingly, however, um, there is an ecosystem building up in Austria, but it's much more driven by the state. So a little bit reflecting on, on how fundamental differences there are between the US and, and, and Austria. Um, there has been some, some um, organizers like, like organizations like the Impact Hub and, and ourselves drumming, uh, drumming a lot for social entrepreneurship for years and, and the ones who had heard the drum were, were actually state actors. So starting two years back, um, different ministries st started their own um, social, well not venture funds because usually they, they don't, uh, they don't seek equity, they simply provide grants, which is quite, uh, quite nice for many who want to start and don't know yet what the business model is. So it's more early stage, um, it's less complex, it's usually state-driven. So currently we are at the stage that we see that this 
uh, field is developing in Vienna and also in other countries in Central East Europe where we're working. So there's a lot going on, but we kind of seek, we are looking for the private actors. They're missing from the game. So if anyone seeks to build up some ecosystems, uh, there is rich opportunities in Central and Eastern Europe. So, yeah, so keying off of this, you know, the one of the current issues in Austria is that the public finance does not make it an exit criteria to attract private capital. And therefore, they become zombies and they, you know, and they, they don't even die off because they get access to, you know, the more grants, a little bit here, a little bit there. And uh, there's no mechanism to do that. And so, they, you know, in Austria, we need to change that, that, that attitude with, uh, yeah. So, so, so far, the, the danger of zombification is not, not too big because there is only early stage funding for social enterprise. So basically when you start a social enterprise now in Austria, you will probably get public funding for the first year. But after that, it is apply or get some sort of different funding um, or not. And, and then, you know, the, the so in, in Germany, you have two social venture funds now that are quite successful going to their third round, right? And, uh, and, and, and so there you have a little bit more of an ecosystem developed already where family offices and foundations are starting to play in an ecosystem role. So is Switzerland and Austria is a little bit behind that. And what we need is the leaders to step forward and say, we're gonna do that and we're gonna be public about that, right? And so I've tried to help activate the investor scene in conjunction with the with the accelerator scene. And you know, it's, it's this takes three, four years, right? And so I'm, I'm not expecting it to go from, you know, with, without three, four or five years. But unless the, the, the locals, so to speak, step up, we international guys cannot really change that. I understand that, yes, because it's always like coming in for a certain period of time and then, and then leaving again. Um, something that you, that you mentioned as well, Joe, was around um, that there is no healthy um, selection right now in a way because there is a lot of um, funding maybe available, so um, maybe uh, ventures that would um, leave or basically fail, um, maybe are having some sort of a lifeline and, and stay. How would you, in general, um, see like the pipeline of entrepreneurs? Do you see interesting ventures coming out of um, Austria? But also, I, I, I guess we can speak about like Austria and like either Germany and Switzerland or basically look more in Central and Eastern Europe. That's maybe more what we do, actually. Well, um, I, I would say so. I mean. One of the interesting things um, for, for all these page social entrepreneurs as I work with um, is that for a couple of years we were not really clear whether these are mainly lifestyle entrepreneurs or people who actually deal with those problems that are most relevant. And um, one, of, one of the tipping points for me for understanding was really two years ago when there was a refugee crisis in Austria. So it was labeled refugee crisis. Labeling is a thing for itself. But uh, so many people coming into the country. Um, and we saw that, that uh, in, in places like Impact Hub or the Social Impact Award that I'm working on, um, many of the new entrepreneurs, they started to work with refugees and on refugee related topics. So, so this was kind of the proof for me that, that social entrepreneurship as a movement is not really, so it's really there where they eat it. And it's not just as some critics say somewhere on the sidelines, people you know, sitting there with their laptops. I think that it's that too, but when, it, when something happens that is relevant and significant, um, then my impression is that social entrepreneurs react, and very interesting ventures come out of that. So, um, what's a good example? I mean, one example that I, that I like very much in, in Greece that we had in social uh, social impact award was a project that started five years ago. Um, they, they dealt with the problem that there is no uh, proper blood um, blood transfusion platform um, um, blood bank. Sorry, that's the one. <laughs> there is no proper blood bank in Athens, so they created an app that um, gets people to sign up for it. And when there is blood needed at the hospital, they send out an alert. And if you have the same blood type, then they call you in. It's a very simple, very very effective way. Um, and I think they saved about their own claims, three, 400 lives with that. So. I think there would be a great opportunity for Austria and the Central Eastern European region to play a catalyst there with respect to refugees and, and everything else. One of the tonic members in Belgium is working with the um, Belgium government to, on a social impact bond, which is a new structure that, uh, that we invested in the first one in, in, in the UK a few years ago, uh, that, uh, that, that does a mentorship program with, uh, with Syrian refugees and measures the impact in, in days of, uh, of, of work that they hold over the next 12 months, right? And it seems to be quite successful. And these uh, partnerships are really between impact investors 
the NGO sector and the government, right? And, and, uh, and, and I'm intrigued by you know, the government together with the Austrian Development Agency, together with AWS, they should actually you know, activate the impact investing community to, to, to participate in that huge opportunity. And, um, and the, the other one with respect to the, um, you know, I was surprised because I was growing up in Innsbruck behind the Iron Curtain, so I really didn't have an appreciation for Central Eastern, Eastern Europe when I was growing up there. Uh, but the Habsburgian Pentecosts are just amazingly strong after you know a hundred years, and I was really surprised by that, you know, and, and uh, positively. And uh, but the corollary is true too that all these, you know, if you talk to people in Romania, entrepreneurs in Romania, Bulgaria, you know, and and, and all these you know countries in the in more eastern side, they are not really equipped yet to uh, tie into the value chains and supply chains of Western Europe. And I think that is the huge opportunity, right, to, uh, to do that. And then if we then make it bank, make them bankable, basically, then the Austrian banking sector would have a good uh, time again as well. <laughs> yes, that sounds promising, I would say. Um, with this, I think I would like to open it to the audience um, and see if there are any questions in the audience. Ah, yes, please. Um, so I. I just want to say thanks for being here um, and kind of like the conversation that we've had. I've worked for the Impact Hub, so I um, thought that it was really actually interesting early on that you kind of de you kind of delineated between uh, social entrepreneurs and traditional entrepreneurs. But I also wonder about like you know this crowd might have different groups in it, but um, traditionally social entrepreneur groups also have a predominantly white middle class um, wealthy group that is kind of part of the crowd, and I'm curious in your experience kind of working with this, what the transition looks like in terms of becoming um, a space that actually is more accessible, is more diverse, and um, is more focused on the um, equity and social justice issues that um, I'd say the communities are facing that are gonna benefit the most from this type of entrepreneurship. I, I think it's one of the most important topics, uh, and as most people here know, that Silicon Valley does not have a good track record on the entrepreneurial side on that. Uh, you know, in, in our accelerators, we make it mandatory, you know, that uh, half of the acceptance are female and half are male on the average, right? And, uh, and there's a huge movement in impact investing about um, gender lens investing and minority investing, not just about gender, right? And, uh, and that goes very deep all the way from making sure that the next genders who are female are part of the conversation and not excluded by the intermediaries. It goes then to creating opportunities for female entrepreneurs. It then goes to making sure that the uh, organizations that we support uh, have enough uh, gender representation and all the way to the products and services that they provide. So it's not just one small thing, right? It's, it's really pervasive and has to be done, um, done, done you know, on, on that level. And we're at, we're at the beginning of this. We're not, way not, not done with this. We are. And I think creating the awareness you know, I think is, is the most important thing around that. And we have, you know, two female entrepreneurs here sitting in the front row, and maybe you can add from your perspective, since you're, you are one of them, you know, just quickly. Ely, we are supporters of Ely. So. <laughs> and, uh, and I have to say that I've known Kevin Turley and Lisa and their family for over 10 years, and they've had such a remarkable influence <laughs> on my ability to be a, an effective entrepreneur and think about the intentionality life on a daily basis, it's been really, really influential as a mentor. Um, so I, I think it, it is actually uh, from a gender lens kind of perspective and, and who is making decisions also from a capital perspective. So we're, for um, the startup that, that I uh, founded, it's focused on um, healthcare, particularly supporting caregivers, uh, family and friends, family caregivers that are um, needing support through the journey of whether it's cancer treatment or stroke or for aging. And so this is an, an issue that is, has a particularly um, important uh, design element uh, for our users <coughs> who um, have, uh, are primarily women. One of the decisions we made that was that recruiting and the channels for recruiting individuals being much more open and trying to be much more creative about that, as well as the flexibility of the, the how we're working. So um, new mothers, there's so someone we just hired that's a, very, that's a new mother, and so having the flexibility to work at different hours, etc. And most of our initial angel investors and, and, um, and seed investors in the family and friend rounds were women. 
and, and primarily that was also by design. So us intentionally reaching out so that that same um, element was so there. So you exception for me, thank you. Yes, I did. <laughs> <laughs> um, and, and so I just yeah, to say yeah, I think yeah, that there's yeah. a ton more work to do, especially in this area of Silicon Valley, because it's not in the demo days or the other and, opportunities. And we, we learn now much more about the implicit uh, you know, the implicit assumptions that our brains make. And we need, to, we need to challenge our brains on that, right? Because we all have that. That's part of how our brain structure works. And without an evolutionary upgrade or without consciousness added to it, you know, you fall into this, into this trap. And so that's very important. Yeah. I just wanted to add to that. I think that creates a huge opportunity as well. So I have a colleague I know who runs a company called Atypica. And what they do is actually, they look at recruiting and in Silicon Valley, uh, the woman who runs it, she's Latina, she basically takes all this data, speaking back to this, um, you know, we could use data for good. She analyzes, you know, how basically uh, companies are doing their HR practices from a gender and minority lens and gives that data back to the company. Uber refused to work with her. Um, and basically like helps them overcome their biases. So if somebody's always hiring, uh, you know, never hiring Asians or something like that, they're working through that. But I think because of where we are today, there's so much opportunity for entrepreneurism to overcome these things as well. Great, great point, thank you. I think, did you wanna add? Uh, yeah. To, to uh, underline question about the diversity in social entrepreneurship and in these fields, uh, both entrepreneurship probably and also social entrepreneurship. Um, one of the things that we see in the impact of data that Sarah was mentioning in the beginning is that there is an interesting pattern of both diversity and, and uh, homogeneity. So when it comes to gender, for example, impact of members and may, well, also many other communities that are called socially diverse, that's more or less balanced. Uh, when it comes to education, or some might not even argue class, then it's a very homogeneous group. And I find it fascinating that, that across the world, it seems that there is an educational elite, if you may, that, that seeks this as a, as a career opportunity. It's not only in the data that I'm collecting, but also in, in the data that many other people found. So this seems to be a pretty strong pattern, that there is diversity on, on a couple of things, uh, topics, gender, mm -hmm. um, also to some level immigration. But uh, when it comes to, to income, that is, that is not given. And I think that's a big problem because Social entrepreneurs are most effective when they choose topics that are close to their heart. So what if you miss like parts of the population and then they also miss their opinions and you also yeah. miss their topics and their needs. So I think those who, who uh, are active in, in shaping this, this movement, uh, they, they should also be aware of that and I hope they are. Thank you for sharing that. I think the, um, the points around design and intentionality are actually very important here, um, and not just taking things as granted and collecting the data and seeing it, but then also um, how do I work this into my objectives and the outcomes that I want to achieve as an organization as well. I think you were actually. I think you were first, so. Oh, okay. Ladies we first. Uh, thank you. This is a kind of follow up question. So you had mentioned, you know, we're talking about data and we're talking about hiring practices. And hiring practices are one thing, but there's this. There's been this huge opportunity gap, obviously, especially for lower income and minority groups. Uh, and you talk about intelligent algorithms, and um, there's been more data to that's um, looking at how algorithms can also have this implicit bias. So I'm curious what that opportunity looks like to really kind of invest in the people who might write algorithms that can actually serve the people in India, maybe by Indians and Africans for Africans. So, um, what might that look like from a social entrepreneur and impact investing perspective? Also, I have to mention that I'm a member of Impact Hub and a social entrepreneur. I work in the civic innovation space. Um, so I just want to say thank you for having this and everything is totally resonating with me. So, thanks. Thank you. <laughs> So I think that bias is one of the uh, most difficult ones to overcome, particularly if you task you know, um, engineers who are part of the Silicon Valley engineering elite, right, to uh, imagine things that are outside of their imagination. As you point out, you know, the bias of, uh, of algorithms is, is as deep as the bias of our brains of who invent these algorithms, right? And I, I think the only way out of that is to engage different brains, right? And, and so, uh, so bringing in 
you know, people from either bringing in people from all over the world who bring different perspectives, or better yet, to collaborate with people, you know, in these countries to actually make sure that they are included from their perspective is the only way to avoid that bias, or to at least partially alleviate it, maybe not avoid it. And how to engage that is, is difficult, so we don't have the answers to that, because I don't think that what I just said, that the VP of engineering of a major company down the road here would agree with. Thank you. Um, I'm not the VP of engineering anymore. <laughs> you go, Victor. Yeah. Um, thanks. So I'm still new to uh, uh, social entrepreneurship, so thank you very much a lot today. Um, but the way I understand it is that still profit is, is still part of it, it's still important. So my question is to what degree is profit important? And at yeah. what point you would maybe walk away from an opportunity? At what point is it no longer considered a social entrepreneurship? It's you know, really towards uh, a nonprofit? Uh, is the idea because probably the margins are lower as well to get to a full for profit? Um, is it a yeah. margins game? Yeah. Is it a, a volumes game in the end? Like how do you see profit? What's, at what point you know does something profit? Like, so profit is very, very, very important um, because we believe that uh, having a financial. So first of all, we like to invest in business models that have the impact integrated into the business, not as an add-on. I I, I'm not a believer in CSR. I think it's at best a marketing gimmick, but usually not even that, and not a good one, right? And so, so if you invest in a business that has impact defined into the business, then as you scale the business, the impact should scale, right? And so in that sense, in order to go to scale with that business, you need capital, and normally you need to act, you normally need to be on the path of, of accessing commercial capital over time because that's the biggest capital available out there in, in just sheer numbers. Our role is to maybe incubate them because uh, if initially they don't have the value creation that pure equity investors would demand, then there's no equity capital available for them. If on top of that initially, they either don't have the cash flow to service a debt or they don't have the collateral to service a debt, then you don't have access to a, a commercial debt, and then we, we, we might have to do a, a loan guarantee to make them, you know, commercially available. So we think about how to how to ease them into the commercial access of capital in order to get them up to scale, and and then you know, reap the benefit of the scale to a business model. So we disagree, we fundamentally disagree with Muhammad Yunus, who says you know uh, uh, profits are bad. I think profits are beautiful and, and important, and because uh, then then you can. Uh, you can then redeploy your capital to others and, and you have a win-win scenario. We didn't talk about the, the opportunities and, and, the, and the, the compensation issues around social entrepreneurs, right? I think they deserve great salaries and great compensation, you know, and if, if they incubate a for-profit company, then they also have equity, right? For instance, as opposed to on the not-for-profit side, you don't have that, and that is an issue, right? Because you, you don't have the leverage of capital. So all these things play together and, and uh, and, but also having said that uh, we invest in social entrepreneurs that need a, a longer time frame to become profitable as well. Not all, in, not all impact investors are doing that, but the ones that have a philanthropic component, uh, you know, either foundation or donor advised fund, a lot of us do that as well. Yeah, sure. Great question. Thank you. Um, one, one, is, one of the things that we are, we are looking at in the survey, we ask people what they see. So what kind of support do they want? Um, and usually, interestingly enough, it, probably because the survey stage, it's not capital. It's peers. So finding someone, finding role models, finding people you can learn from in, a, in an indirect way, and it's access to, to all sorts of knowledge providers. And only then comes capital, only then comes uh, access to talent. So I would say, believing that the social entrepreneurship is a game of numbers, you would really need to focus on getting the word out there that it exists and that this is a viable career opportunity. Because already entrepreneurship has kind of a, well here it has a big lobby, but in Austria at least it doesn't have a big old lobby. Um, and social entrepreneurship usually gets not seen at all. So getting it on the radar screen and then equipping people with some applicable 
knowledge and the Google networks. I think when we make that happen, then the capital will follow. So I, ideally, I would like to see the ecosystem that uh, Silicon Valley has with respect to entrepreneurs, from family and friends to, um, to A round, to B round, to mezzanine, to IPO, replicated globally for social entrepreneurs, just for social entrepreneurs, which means that if you have seed round funders like the accelerators, whom do we then, uh, you know, the access to do the uh, A rounds, and whom do they access to do the B rounds, and in each one of these different layers are different inhibitors, right? The inhibitors on the uh, in, on the seed round is actually entrepreneurs who have, who have who have a financial understanding. So if you if you know if I mean you would not believe, but you know in these a lot of these accelerators, the you know, entrepreneurs come in very naively and great, good, they have a good vision, but they have no clue about how to make a business out of that, right? And that usually takes about, if they want to learn, that takes two to three years. It's not a one-year effort, right, to, to, to sort of uh, educate them around the, how, how to do that. So that is, there's so many entrepreneurs who are incredibly um, mission-driven, but just have no business acumen yet, right? And so that's, the, that's, that's the, uh, an entry criteria that, that is very difficult to solve. Later, in, in let's say let's say we finance somebody with with a tonic deal, you know, between four hundred thousand and maybe one and a half million, and then they are successful and they need maybe five to eight million. Well, that's already getting you know, uh, so so the, it's getting thinner on that level. And then if you get into the real equity deals, um, people say they would they would have the capital available, uh, but it's there's frankly there's not that many social entrepreneurs who have made it to that to that level. And so when, when we support social entrepreneurs, we say, you know, if you don't make us successful with our exits, then we will not be able to scale, right? And, and people will say, social entrepreneurs, great, but you never make any money, and you don't really have an impact. And they're partially true. So the symbiotic relationship between investors and investees are, is sometimes not respected by the entrepreneur. I don't work with entrepreneurs who don't respect that. Uh, do you think that um, social entrepreneurship is connected to nationalism? I'm asking this question because I recently saw more and more badges online made in Austria, made in Sweden, made in Europe, made in France, made in wherever in Europe. Um, not only products, not creating plastic products instead of China in Europe, but really coding, creating software products in Europe, in Austria, as a benefit of better payments, of not outsourcing. Do you think that there's any connection also to social entrepreneurship? Because people are using these topics in their pitches in front of investors to really say, okay, we are hiring only people from uh, the European Union. We are not outsourcing to India, to Romania, to wherever from. They, they really use this as being the, the great angels, the, the nice guys to, to keep it in the country where it's really completely contrary to the whole world wide web and the whole idea about that. Yeah. Well, um, most of the work integration social enterprises, they typically tend to focus on, on the uh, target of like, specific groups with needs, so like uh, people with intellectual disabilities. So there I wouldn't see a nationalism card. But um, what, is, what is interesting about your statement is, is that, that really um, many of the, of the jobs in, social, in the social economy in the world sense are service jobs. And that means that they are not as easily exportable and replaceable. So one of the reasons that the European Union put social business, in, that's again their wording, um, high on the agenda was, well, that's a growing sector, one of the last growing sectors we have, and it's not exportable. So th there can be some sort of reasoning there, but I, I wouldn't necessarily label it as nationalism. Thank you. Good. Um, so if we take, we'll take one last question. Um, I know it's in hand. Oh, um, and we'll then... Um, Move it to um, to cool off <laughs> with some more um, let's start some water and um, conversation. Yeah, and beer <laughs> and conversation. But please go ahead. I feel lucky. I got the last question. <laughs> um, bringing it back to tech and innovation uh, with social entrepreneurship. I don't know anything about Austrian industries and capabilities other than I think I just learned Truber is Austrian. <laughs> That's my favorite beer. There's a reason for that. <laughs> um, blockchain technology, smart contracts. Do you see an overlap, ever see an overlap in Austria 
So I think that the whole blockchain um, technology is a very promising one for different um, for different opportunities, including you know direct democracy, including financial systems and, and, and what have you, right? And uh, so in that sense, it's not Austrian or US centric. I think it's a more global opportunity. And uh, when I think about the, you know, right now it's, it's, it's going through growing pains uh, and it would not, you know, because of volatility, it's not being accepted yet uh, by, by the major economies. And, and if it were, it would pose a problem of, um, of, of, of um, sovereignty from a nationalist state standpoint, right? Because right now the nations insist on military and on, on, on their currencies. European notwithstanding going through big upheaval because of that, right? And but in, in general that technology can be a, a but I don't see it as an Austrian thing. Okay. Yeah. Yeah. okay. Um then with this, um I would like to say a very big thank you to both Charlie and Peter and thank you all for coming. <laughs>